morning, everyone. I'm Liz Fernandez with APIS Training, and I would like to welcome you to today's webinar. Our speaker today is Mark Hutchinson. Mark is an extension professor with the University of Maine. His education and research programs focus on soil health, compost processes, and animal mortality management. Professor Hutchinson is a member of the Maine Compost Team, a USDA APIS compost subject matter expert, and a certified crop advisory. Currently, he is involved in numerous research projects funded through Northeast Star, National Pork Board, and USDA APHIS. Mark has been with the university for over 20 years. And with that, I'm going to hand the webinar over to Mark. Great. Thanks, Liz. I'd also like to acknowledge uh, Rob Minkus from the USDA APHIS for inviting me to make this presentation today. So today we're going to talk a little bit about the use of comp carcass compost and basically, you know, the, the effects or the use of the compost after catastrophic or foreign animal disease events. As a trained agronomist, I see that there are lots of opportunities for this compost to be used uh, for agronomic utilizations so that there's opportunities and challenges. And we'll talk about those opportunities and challenges today. The opportunity I see is that the compost is definitely a soil amendment. A lot of people <laughs> want to use it as a fertility source, but it really is a, there's a contrast between soil amendments and soil fertility. So we're going to talk about it as a soil amendment today. And then the challenge is some of them are perceptions and some of them are truths. So the perception is that it has some nitrogen tie-up. Uh, we'll talk about bones, and we'll talk about particle size, and then we'll talk about issues around applications. Let's start with the opportunities. The opportunity uh, after some of these large catastrophic events, there's a large quantity of compost material. Um, these are pictures from the outbreak in 2015, which I was involved with, um, with acres and acres of mostly broiler uh, compost and turkey compost. And the question became, what do you do with this material after uh, it's gone through the USDA process of composting and it's been released for, for use? One of the things that we found over the years of researching compost and the use of compost is that a single application of compost can increase crop yields for multiple years. So not only, not only is it good for the year that you're actually applying the material, but it has long-term residual effect. There's research that actually shows that the compost will have a residual effect on yield up to three years, and possibly there's some research that's out there that will even say four years. So the question becomes, is, is this, you know, you know, how does this actually work? How does compost affect the yield for that long? When we know that, you know, a lot of the systems that are growing corn, soybeans in the Midwest or our, our smaller farms here in the Northeast with our fruit and vegetables, you know, everyone's looking for a nitrogen source. Compost is definitely not going to be that nitrogen source. So one of the things that you got to think about when you think about compost and how it affects the overall soil components, there are three different components the soils, there's the structural component of it, the chemistry, and the biological. And most of the time when you're talking about compost, you're talking about how it affects all three of these different components. In a lot of conventional uh, agriculture, however, when you start talking about soil applications, we're talking about how it affects the chemistry of the soil and how, how those nutrients are plant available. So a lot of times we're only talking about one small fraction of the soil components when we're talking about conventional agriculture uh, and particularly around fertility. One of the things I want to do is I want to show you some of the, the, the ideas behind the fertility of the compost. And I'm going to start by looking at some of the common sources of nitrogen fertilizer for uh, conventional fertilizers out there. So anhydrous ammonia is commonly used in the Midwest. Um, here in the East, we use more of the urea, the ammonia nitrates, and diammonium phosphates. But as you look at the percentages, you know, the percent nitrogen um, and the pounds per ton, 
is really what I want you to focus on. So if you put a ton of urea on the ground, there's about 920 pounds of nitrogen that's going to become, uh, that's available to a plant or partially available to a plant. That's a lot of nitrogen per ton. And you can see the other uh, types of fertilizer there as well. That contrasts significantly with the way in which compost works. So here are some uh, compost samples that I've collected over the years. For some reason, I seem to be the, the person that these samples get sent to, and I've kind of developed a database of hundreds of different samples from catastrophic events, and both from disease events and from um, different types of market disruptions or compost trials or floods or whatever the event may be. Uh, I've asked different people from different states to send me the compost results. And what this chart shows you is the, what the event is, what the species of the primary species that we had to manage during that outbreak was, and then the pounds of total nitrogen per ton on an average. This is an aggregate of, of multiple samples. And it also includes the moisture content. <clears throat> So as you look down through the nitrogen, uh, total nitrogen, and this is, again, a, a combination of the organic and inorganic fraction of the compost, you can see that it's quite variable between the different types of events and also between the different types of species that is out there. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> I really want to also focus a little bit on the North Carolina uh, low path avian influenza outbreak uh, and the turkeys, and this just happened in uh, early 2019. When that, those compost piles were actually released uh, and sampled, the, the total nitrogen availability was about 36 uh, pounds per ton. But as it sat over time, the total nitrogen became 15 pounds of nitrogen per ton. So something happened between the time that it was actually released from the state uh, regulations or released to the farm for application and the time that it was uh, stockpiled there. And there's a lot of things that are happening in a compost pile over time. The biological processes continue to happen. There's some loss through volatilization. Uh, there may be a little bit of loss through leaching if, there's, if it gets wet. And this is one of the things that I wanted you to look at is at the moisture as well. If you look at the turkeys when released moisture, it was about 30%, 29%. And when it was five months later, it was 59%. So obviously it, it got saturated. It received a lot of rain and it lost the nitrogen probably through some leaching aspects of it as it was stacked. So that's a, that's a concern about uh, leaving it stacked in potential loss uh, over time. Uh, so stacking and how it's stacked and how it's stored uh, becomes a really important issue. And larger piles uh, provide more buffer from loss, from leaching, uh, as opposed to smaller windrows. The other reason I want to put the moisture in here, you can see also that that's variable depending on the type of species that it is, is that when you're dealing with compost and you're putting applying it on a per ton basis, moisture becomes a real issue. So if you put um, a ton of compost from the Nebraska outbreak uh, for 20 pounds in at 34% moisture versus going down to in North Carolina, uh, and it's 59%, you're going to put almost one and a half times as much on uh, and a ton uh, for the Nebraska one as you would for the North Carolina one. So the rate or the amount of compost that you're actually getting is quite variable. And this is why I encourage people when they start talking about compost applications to talk about on a per yard basis rather than on a per ton basis, unless you can take the moisture component out of it. <clears throat> 
the compost is, is quite variable, and you don't get those same issues around with conventional fertilizer. If you have a ton of urea, it's going to be a ton no matter whether it's in Maine or whether it's in California or Texas. It's, it's a ton. Uh, compost is not the same. A ton of compost has a different volume depending on the moisture content. So how does compost really work and how does it actually uh, affect all three components of the, the soil that we saw in, in the soil health? Really what you're looking at is compost is, is really um, a lot of organic matter and what that does is it increases the cation exchange capacity. The cation exchange capacity is the soil's ability to actually hold plant nutrients in place. So <clears throat> compost and, and organic material has a have negative sites. Most of your plant nutrients have positive or positive cations. So the more negative sites that you have, the more sites there are for those positive cations to attract to and to be actually be held in place. So this is where you get the, the biggest bang for your dollar when you start adding uh, organic matter and you increasing that cation exchange capacity of the soil and the soil's ability to actually hold those nutrients in place. I don't have <laughs> nitrogen here, but we know that nitrogen comes in many different uh, forms uh, from nitrate to ammonia to ammonium. Uh, and nitrate, of course, is a negative, so it's not going to attract the soil, but the ammonium, NH3, uh, will actually weakly bond to the organic matter and be held in, in place. So <clears throat> increasing the, the cation chain capacity or increasing the soil organic matter can actually increase the efficiency of the conventional fertilizers that, that you may be applying by holding that ammonia fraction in place in the soil. So there's a real benefit there for both the nitrogen, even though it's not supplying a nitrogen, the compost is not supplying a lot of nitrogen, it actually has the ability to hold some of those, uh, some of that nitrogen in place longer. So as you see, you know, typical cation exchange capacity for different soil textures, um, you know, sandy loam is, is really poor at holding nutrients, clay is a little bit better, but again, as you as you add organic matter, you can see it becomes you know ten, uh, at least tenfold greater in the cation change capacity, and this is really the the benefit that we're trying to promote to farms and to ag to ag agronomic systems. That it's not that you're adding the compost for nutrient value; you're adding it for that uh, cation change capacity and that organic matter, and that you're feeding the soil community. Uh, which will eventually feed the, the plant. So with that, uh, you know, how, how do we apply uh, compost and, and, you know, at what rates do we actually apply the compost? So one of the questions has always been, you know, uh, you know is there equipment out there that actually is specific to it, and the answer to that is yes, there are actually compost applicators now. Uh, here in Maine at uh, our research farm, we just use an old-fashioned uh, rear discharge manure sprinter. It works great, and uh, we can actually calibrate the, the ground speed so that we're getting the application rate that we want. Um, is it perfect? Absolutely not, but again, you're dealing with a compost, and you're not measuring this with, uh, with a beaker and, and a pipette. To, to get the right amount on the field, but you, you want to get in the ballpark. The picture on the right, D.C., uh, Pennsylvania, this is a what they call a vertical compost applicator. This is a, a compost that's actually being applied uh, on wheat stubble uh, in late summer. Uh, they're going to come, they'll eventually come in here and no-till this um, back into some wheat or into, uh, or leave it into a cover crop. Uh, but you can see that those are vertical uh, beaters in the back that actually apply the compost. And the one in the lower left is in Iowa. This is a, a, a large uh, rear discharge horizontal beater. They're actually using it here to actually form windrows, but it, it was its primary purpose is for actual uh, field application of compost. And this, that material, that, that actually uh, holds about almost 20 yards of compost at a time to go, go to the field. So one of the issues that, that I hear quite often is, 
you know, when you're dealing with carcass composting, what about obstacles, uh, foreign objects and bones? We'll talk a little bit more about them. But, uh, you know, these types of manure spreaders uh, are pretty robust and pretty hardy. And, and unless it's really large chunks, large pieces of metal, uh, even large bones will go through these. But um, and two of my years, I've, I've used enough of these to know that we are going to get foreign objects and we just have to be careful. But for the most part, um, these manure spreaders are pretty robust and will handle the material that comes through the compost piles. So here's the application rate that we want to want to look at. And I, I want to give a shout out to uh, Dr. Melissa Wilson at the University of Minnesota. She actually took these pictures um, and did this demonstration uh, at a project that she's working on in Minnesota. And it kind of gives you the idea of how much compost you actually want to apply. A lot of times, you know, we're trying to, uh, organizations or agencies are trying to figure out what's the agronomic rate of compost. And they're trying to figure out on a per nitrogen basis. But again, there's so little nitrogen uh, 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 as a rule in compost that it's really not, you're going to over apply the nitrogen uh, if you try to do it on an agronomic rate. So really what you're looking for is to add this compost as a soil amendment to feed the biological community in the soil. And just like any of us sitting down at a meal, uh, you know, we just got through Thanksgiving and there's a, you know, people probably have large feast and there are probably leftovers and, and going into Christmas, you're going to do the same thing. So, but what you want to do with soils is, is kind of what you do on a daily basis. You only prepare enough food so that, you know, you can feed yourself for that day and, and, you know, sustain yourself. And if you continue to over apply or overeat, we know that we all gain weight and, um, you know, we know the adverse effects of it. And the same thing happens with compost. Is you, if you over-apply compost, there becomes adverse effects of adding compost. And we have seen this. Uh, I, I have a seven-year uh, study going on that looks at compost applications over time, over those seven years, at lots of different rates. And we have actually seen decreases in yield. This is on greenhouse tomatoes, a little bit different than an economic crop. But we have seen decreased yields in tomatoes and high rates of compost over the years. And I see this also in, in field squash and peppers where we've applied too much compost and we actually see a negative effect of the compost uh, in those cropping systems. So really what you're looking for is something around that 10 to 15 yards of, or 15 ton, these are in tons. Uh, but I'd like to do it in yards, so it's somewhere between 10 and 15 uh, yards of compost. And the, the average bulk density is about uh, 1,000 pounds of compost per yard, per yard. So in a ton, there's actually two cubic yards. So in, a tw in 10 tons, you're actually going to apply about 20 yards. So that's, that's a... Actually, on the high rate, the 10 ton would be on the higher rate that I would recommend. Uh, the 20 ton would definitely be an excessive application. But it kind of gives you a, a visual of what the application rate looks like. I oftentimes describe this to, to groups that it's kind of like spreading, uh, or sprinkling the pepper on your mashed potatoes. That you don't put a huge black layer over the top of your mashed potatoes. It's just a little bit of sprinkle on the top to give it some flavor, uh, but it's not an excessive amount. And that's, again, what you want to do with compost is you want to apply it so that you're feeding those microbes, but you're not overwhelming the microbes. <clears throat> so as an agronomist and surf a crop advisor, we oftentimes talk about the four hours of applications of materials uh, and fertilizers, you know, it's the right place, the right time, the right source. So I encourage people to think about that and to plan uh, for that when they're actually thinking about applying compost, whether it be, you know, an everyday event or whether it be after a catastrophic event. You know, what is the right place for it? Is it uh, after 
you take off the corn or the soybeans and you're coming in with a cover crop maybe, or are you putting it in right before you're going to plant? What is the right uh, place and time for that particular material? And is it the right source? Uh, does the field actually need to increase that organic matter? And is this compost the right source for it? And what is the rate that you're actually going to use? How much compost are you going to actually use? Most states uh, will have some regulations on fertility, and most farms need to have a nutrient management plan. So even though I discount or I don't include a lot of the, the nitrogen in this uh, compost, it actually needs to be included in most of your nutrient management plans, as well as, as, well as the phosphorus that's in there. Because if you apply most compost at a nitrogen rate, you're going to way over apply the phosphorus. So one of the challenges with the uh, carcass compost, and you know, we've we I've been working with carcasses for a long time and, and have run into challenges. And one of the things that's nice about this work is that we've overcome a lot of those challenges through um, and, and filled in some of those gaps that we that we've been missing. And one of the issues has always been on particle size. So um, what's the particle size that's actually in the finished compost, and and how can you actually uh, work with that. I'm gonna, I'll show you some pictures here in a minute uh, about that. The other is the seed-end ratio. In commercial compost, we talk about a seed-end ratio starting somewhere between 25 to 31 and ending somewhere between 18 and 20 to 1. But when you've got a whole carcass and you're blending it with compost, you really can't do a seed-end ratio. But there are ways that we've actually started working on that we can actually now start to uh, kind of narrow up that CN ratio, and, and you can see the picture on the right, and that's through grinding, um, using particle reduction through the through some of these big horizontal or tub grinders. That's to reduce the particle size and also so that we can start to control some of that CN ratio. Bones have always uh, been a concern, particularly when we're not grinding. Uh, you, you end up with the large bones, and I'll, I'll show you some pictures of that. And the other is the foreign objects, you know, rocks and metals that you may uh, get through uh, sourcing. So one of the things about all of these is that you really need to start at the front end and the planning part of it. Um, the, the particle size issue really begins at the, at the beginning. So what is your source of carbon? And it's usually the carbon that's the problem, you know, when you're dealing with dead stock uh, um, catastrophic events, you're, you're, you're not going to pick up stuff out of the barn as a rule or, you know, they're going to be, the animals themselves are going to be pretty free of contaminants. Uh, but, you know, as you source your carbon for these events, you need to make sure you understand what you're getting. You know, so which pile in, this, in these pictures are acceptable? The pile on the left is obviously not acceptable, uh, even though we'd like to try. I think that's one of the gaps is can we actually use whole stumps or whole trees as a source of carbon uh, for catastrophic events and grind, co-grind at the same time that we're dealing with managing the carcasses? I think that's a, a gap in our knowledge and something that we're, we're, we're going to address here uh, over a period of time. The picture on the right, uh, you know, this pile looks great. It's got uh, some really good carbon sources in it, uh, but you can see I've, I've kind of highlighted that there's a there's a stump there, there's a a log there that didn't get ground. Uh, and if you're if you're a loader operator and you're loading a 18 wheeler with it, are you really going to stop and pull that out of the pile? Probably not. So that's going to end up in the pile. Uh, unfortunately, it's going to be transported to the farm or to the event, and it's going to end up in that pile, and it could end up in the grinder or it could end up in the compost, and then it could come through the compost. So it's, it's one step after another, but there are lots of opportunities for those types of particles to be pulled out so it's not affecting the composting process nor is it affecting the application process. <laughs> it's just a matter of people being aware of it and actually taking the time to pull it out. The particles, uh, you know, that large particles, 
one of the interesting things is that the picture on the left has is a, almost 100% carbon, but none of that carbon is available to the microbes during the composting process. And so it's, it's useless. Even some of the particles that you see in the picture on the right, the large particles, the microbes don't uh, use it as a carbon source, but it's important for the composting process in order to build the pile structure. So particle size is, is a double-edged sword. You want large, larger particles for the particle for the pile structure, but you want the smaller particles so the microbes have something to actually get their carbon from. <clears throat> this is a picture in Iowa where we were building piles and you can see that the large chunk <laughs> of wood, wood product came through. Uh, it has no compost value of this size and it's, and it's extremely hard on equipment as all of you know. So <clears throat> it is really not that difficult to just strictly, you know, stop, pull this to the side. There aren't going to be that many of them if you do a really good job sourcing your carbon, uh, and the few that you get can be easily easily managed. <clears throat> like I said, also, the, you know, particle size and carbon sourcing starts right at the beginning. So one of the things I want to do today is kind of give you some tools for, for planning purposes. So these are two job aids that uh, are, were developed by the USDA APHIS. Uh, and available. One is to actually show you different sources or types of uh, carbon uh, products that can, can and cannot be used uh, or acceptable during the composting process. And the other is uh, kind of a template for you if you are sourcing different carbon material, how to have a conversation with that supplier. What the types of questions to ask, what types of information to actually gather. And these are things that you really should do prior to any type of catastrophic event. So this, is, this goes into your planning process. And I think one of the things that, that we've done through the years is we've done a really good job of developing um, management programs or composting systems or disposal systems and planning for these large catastrophic events from everything from depopulation to disposal to decontamination. But one of the things in the disposal that is really still a gap, and we've seen it numerous times now during these events, is, oh, we've got yards, acres of compost. Now, do we, now what are we going to do with it? What's the end use of it? And to me, that really needs to be part of the initial planning process and, and considered way before any type of event actually occurs. And I'll give you some, some additional tools besides these at, towards the end. Particle size also relates to the carbon to nitrogen ratio. So it's um, really what you want to do is you want that, that finished car compost to actually have a CDN ratio less than 20 to 1. Uh, we know through a lot of different research that's been conducted that if compost has a CDN ratio greater than 30 to 1, that that material is actually going to cause nitrogen type when you apply to the soil. But if it's less than 20 to 1, then it actually does not tie up nitrogen. And one of the, the misconceptions out there is that large particles are the cause or can cause nitrogen tie-up. The large particles that you see in this picture, some of it's corn stover, some of it's wood chips, but wood chips particularly, people don't want to apply the field because they're going to, uh, afraid it's going to cause nitrogen tie-up. Those wood chips in the soil are much like they are in, in the compost. They're not really a carbon source for the microbes, and the microbes are really what is what's causing the nitrogen tie-up. So, if those larger particle sizes aren't a carbon source, then the microbes don't have a, a significantly large um, carbon source to, to actually build more proteins and to reproduce. So it's not going to cause that uh, nitrogen tie-up that we all expect. Uh, I've done numerous pot studies and numerous field studies looking at different compost maturities and 
timing and maturities and looking at different seed-end ratios uh, and have yet to find finished compost that has a seed-end ratio of less than 20 to 1 to cause any type of nitrogen tie-up. And this is, this is compost that has uh, large chips in it as well as the fines that, that uh, disappear. So one of the things that you can do is if you that if you really want to look and see if this material is going to cause nitrogen tie up is, is to measure the biological activity of the compost. Uh, there are several different ways to do this, but one of the ways you can do it in the field is called a Salvita test. It measures the amount of active carbon dioxide being produced, and that's a measure of biological activity. And it also act, act, measures the amount of ammonia present in that. Uh, compost, which can also cause uh, problems when applied to the field. So the Solvita test is a, is a really good, quick, it's a four-hour test that can be done in the field. It's a really good, quick way to know whether what the stage of that compost in, is in and whether that can actually cause problems on, upon application. So how does CDM, how does a nitrogen tie-up work and, and what's the process? So it's a fairly simple process, straightforward as far as nitrogen tie up and you know, you apply the compost soil, it it actually gets tied up as organic nitrogen because the, the soil microorganisms are gonna uh take it in and they're gonna tie that up in their proteins and their their body structures and they're gonna increase rapidly over time because they've got this influx of new food. Uh, and those populations are going to grow, and then once they run out of food or they're or easily available food, those populations are going to start to die off. And at that point in time, they start to release those nitrogen, that nitrogen back into the into the soil. So it's not a matter that the nitrogen is actually lost; it's just a matter that it is temporarily tied up in the soil microbiological population uh, for a period of time. And that period of time really depends on moisture, weather. Uh, soil conditions, there's a lot of different things that can affect it. So this is a, a, a research project that uh, I completed in 2017. Uh, it, it, it's a, for the farmer, it was an oh, no moment. Uh, on the left, um, these are beans, uh, string beans being grown, but you can see that uh, the difference in the color. You can see the flags where the start of the compost application uh, but the color differentiation was caused because the, he's a conventional farmer and he turned off the fertilizer belt, uh, the pre, the pre-plant fertilizer at the time where the, it changes colors. And, you know, there was a, there was a significant, uh, nitrogen effect because of that, you know, and they didn't have that, uh, early nitrogen to get it really greened up and get it going, but, you can see two weeks later what happened, you know, because of time and because of the process, the, the biology in the soil, those microbes chewed up the nitrogen, the organic nitrogen into the bodies. They died. They released it. It became crop available to the crop. And we picked as much off the research plots as we did off the conventional um, plots in this field. So it's, it's, it's thinking about the, the cropping system in a little bit different ways and being a little bit patient with the biological and soil processes. Bone management has always been an issue, particularly if you have, uh, if you're doing whole carcass composting, uh, but we found that over time the bones become brittle, at least most of the bones. Uh, they will go through the manure applicators or the compost applicators uh, that you're using uh, you know, the femur, the head bone, the hip bones, you know, remain the longest. Uh, but again, they're going to be able to, they'll eventually break down and become uh, brittle enough that they'll actually go through. Uh, I've driven over enough cow skulls uh, with our farm tractors to know that, you know, they actually crush in the field or they crush on the pad, uh, wherever. So they really, uh, to me, they're, they're not an issue, but they're aesthetically more of an issue than anything. Um, I've never heard of someone having a flat tire because of a bone in a field or never heard anyone uh, 
applying compost that's had a bone break piece of equipment. Um, and almost all of our dairy farmers here in New England, you know, now compost their they're dead. So it's a, it's a fairly common practice to, to go through this. Poultry bones are, are small and brittle, so, you know, those are usually uh, not an issue. The, the, it's interesting that the leg femur tends to stay around a little bit longer for some reason. It doesn't break down, but it's so brittle that it, it breaks up fairly quickly. One of the ways that we've started to manage these on a larger scale is if you grind uh, for particle management and T-N ratio management, uh, then these bones become a non-issue. Grinding, man, grinding carcasses for management, it, it, it's, to me, it's a, on large events, this is a, it makes composting and the use of the composting a lot more um, user friendly and a, a lot faster and a lot more practical. It gets our farmers, I think it can get our farmers back into production a lot faster um, and with a product that they are gonna be more acceptable to. So you're gonna decrease particle size uh, but what's important is in the grinders is to make sure that we use the right size screens. So they come in a lot of different screens. There's usually two sets of screens, the top and bottom screens. They can be diamond, they can be square, they can be you know, different uh, rectangles, they can be different sizes or different shapes. But we want to make sure that we're putting in screens that we're getting the particle size on the discharge end that we want for field application. So you want to make sure, and. Uh, Bobby Clark from Virginia has written a, a, a kind of a handbook on or some spec sheets on grinders and screens, and that's a really good um, document if you're thinking about uh, grinding or screen sizes for grinders. So a couple other things that manages the bones, so they become a non-issue, and you also blend the carbon nitrogen material, and you get this really good C-to-N ratio, or you can. The other issue that it really helps with is moisture control because even though we're not talking about the composting process, the grinding allows or forces the moisture from the carcasses into that uh, particle mix and it allows it, you, you don't get the, the sudden burst and release of fluids from the carcasses and uh, able to manage your moisture a lot better and so you get a lot more consistent product out of the grinding. So as I said, focus has been primarily on the carcass management, which it should be. This is our, our primary focus on a disease outbreak. Uh, you know, I was told years ago that you're not here to make pretty compost, you're here to manage the carcasses, and that, this is very true. But at the end of the day, we also have to be able to use the end product, uh, and that end product has agronomic value. So I think it's really important that we start, uh, that we include, or it's been one of the gaps that we include, you know, the end use of this compost into our management plans and our, and, our, and our planning for these large events. So I call it backwards planning. So, you know, instead of saying, oh, we're going to compost, and then at the end of the day figuring out what you're going to do with the compost, I think you ought to ask yourself, what am I going to do with the compost if I compost, and how much am I actually going to have? So it's kind of backwards planning. Uh, it's something I've used in education for a long time, so it's quite familiar with me. So you start at the end and work to the beginning to get to the end. So one of the things that you have to know is what are the current regulations for compost application? And each state's going to be a little bit different. Uh, each region could be a little bit different, but you also you, you need to check those regulations out. There's no sense of going through the, the process of composting if there's going to be a lots of issues around the app application or use of that product. Uh, and there may be routine uh, regulations, but there may not be anything for a catastrophic event. So you want to ask the question is, you know, do these work for large catastrophic events? And if so, you know, are there differences between the two? The other thing that you need to know is, is how much product will actually be produced. And you can start to uh, do some back of the envelope calculations about compost and how much compost will actually be processed through an event. And that event, of course, it, a lot of times we don't know what the what the end is going to look like or how many animals we're going to be dealing with through an event uh, when it first starts. But 
you certainly can do some planning ahead of time to say if the event is has this number of animal units and or this number of animal units, you can start to process. You can start to figure out, you know, how much end product you're going to have, which goes along with how much carbon you need, how many grinders you may need, or how much space you may need, uh, and particularly how many acres you may need for the actual end product. So I've given some uh, some really simple ways to for estimating the amount of compost that you may have. <coughs> and I base this off from animal units. So it can be used for any species of animals, poultry, turkeys, hogs, cattle, whatever it is. So it's the number of animal units, which is you know standard animal units, a thousand pounds. And for each animal unit you're gonna have, you're gonna get about six cubic yards of of carbon material per animal unit, roughly. And you're gonna have a reduction factor of about 0.66, which is through the composting process, you're gonna, the voids are gonna fill, the particles are gonna get smaller, you're gonna lose uh, material from CO2 reduction. So you can have about a, a, you know, a good round number is a, about two thirds of what you start with is what you're gonna end up with. So that's the total cubic yards of compost per event. From that, you can then say, uh, and then you can estimate the number of acres. And if you use a standard, or what I would recommend is 10 cubic yards per acre, then you can actually calculate the number of acres that you would actually need for that particular event. So the soil, the, and you got to remember that this this application rate is based as a soil amendment, not as not based on nutrient availability. And again, I would encourage people to think about that process, to think about it as a soil amendment, not as a nutrient uh, um, product. Yes, you're going to have to account for those nutrients, but it's probably not going to be a significant amount. It certainly is not going to be enough to actually grow a crop. So using compost or organic matter has a long history in agriculture. You know, way back before we started using synthetic fertilizers after World War II, you know, composting and organic material was the primary source. So, you know, why was it so important? It's because we fed the soil and we depended on the soil to actually feed our crops. Unlike today where a lot of agriculture depends on the fertilizer to feed the crops and not necessarily the soil to feed the crops. So, you know, I want us to think about the history and, and where we're moving forward and how we can again change the history maybe to influence it to go back to using the compost um, and building those biological soils. This, by the way, is a picture of my grandfather and my father um, back in the late 30s, when right before they bought their first ports and coming out of the barn after making some hay. So that's the end. I, I think we're going to try to open it up for some questions, Liz, right? And, uh, this is yep. not what it looks like in Maine today, but. <laughs> yeah, we've got a bunch of questions. Um, the first one is, why aren't chemicals better for CEC? Why aren't chemicals better for CEC? Uh, so CEC is chemical. Why aren't chemicals better for CEC? Uh, I'm not sure if I understand the question. Chemi chemicals, uh, most of your Chemical fertilizers are are cations, so I'm not sure what I'm not I'm not I'm not sure if I'm understanding the question. Okay, and then she asks, um, I can see compost as humus, consequently structure and biological positive factors for years after application. Um, please explain bioavailability. So bioavailability would be the um, the carbon that's actually available to the microorganisms. So um, I, a lot of times I ex explain the availability of carbon as uh, like with a Thanksgiving turkey. If you have the whole turkey, you don't you don't just take the whole turkey out of the oven and start uh, and eat it. Uh, one person eats that turkey. You carve it. You put it on a platter, you put it on your plate, you, you make smaller bites and you pieces, and then you chew from there. So 
thinking about bioavailability is not all carbon uh, has the right particle size or has the right structure for the microbes to chew on. So it, particle size has to have enough surface area and um, texture for those organisms to work on in order to actually uh, digest or to chemically break down the, the carbon for the use. And it all has to do with particle size. Okay, the next question is, have you ever looked at stratification of nitrate, nitrogen, or potassium as it moves downward in large stockpiles, assuming mobile nutrients likely don't all leach out of the pile? Oh, the answer to that is yes. And there's a, a Dr. Bill Seekins and I wrote a article back in 2016, I think it was released in Compost Science and Utilization. I'm glad to share that with you. And, and actually, uh, the findings point that the nitrogen actually moves upwards in the pile. Uh, so it actually moves from around the carcass uh, up through just below the surface where then it gets, uh, all of a sudden it, 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 it can get some oxygen again and then it converts from ammonia back to the nitrate and actually retains in the pile uh, a large percentage of it. So the, the misconception is that nitrogen or mobile nutrients move downward in the pile a lot of those nutrients either stay stationary or they move up. And where you get the loss of the nutrient is where the, the water actually runs underneath the pile and actually wicks uh, nutrients from a, the bottom of the pile in the bottom three to four inches of that pile, depending on how it got saturated. But most of the nutrients, mobile nutrients, actually move upwards because that's where the moisture, uh, the air is actually flowing up in the pile and it's pulling moisture as well as as uh, nutrients up, up through the pile. And I'm willing to, I, 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 no, I'm, I'm, again, I, I'm glad to share that article with people so they can see the data. Yeah, if you share it with me, um, I can go ahead and send it out to all the people on the attendee list. That'd be great. The next question is, when we think about the layer applied, what is the thickness, for example, of 10 to 20 tons per acre? So. 10 to 20 tons per acre of compost is is less than an inch. It is extremely small, and it's and you can see through on those charts that uh, there are actually gaps in it where there's some spots that actually don't get any, but that's that's okay because microbes will move and and do that. So it's it's you're not you know you see the old literature that talks about two to three inches of compost, and the, those are those application rates reach up into the 90 to 100 uh, tons of compost per acre, and those are way excessive application rates. The next question is, can you describe no-till compost application to wheat stubble? So basically what would happen is you would apply the compost over the top of the stubble, and then you would no-till plant through that uh, and just leave the compost application on the surface. And what people have found is that there's the macroorganisms, the earthworms basically in the soil, will actually come up and grab that, that um, compost particles and pull it down into the soil. So over a period of time, it, that compost will actually disappear because of biological activity. But it's a combination of compost application and then the compost and then the no-till process using no-till drills and so on. Okay. Is this type of compost only used for large crops, or would it ever be available for home gardens and shrubbery? So a lot of that depends on, on state laws, but uh, at least here in the state of Maine and most of New England, uh, uh, carcass composting can be used for any application. It's not uh, restricted to large-scale agronomic situations. So we have several companies here in Maine that um, – we don't have rendering, so we do almost all of our animals go to composting, uh, and those companies are able to sell to whomever for whatever. Um, old ladies with little flower gardens to potting mixes, so. Okay, um, this is more of a statement. If farmers can till it in, there's a lot of difference between three inch deep versus 12 inch deep incorporation. In my backyard, I have much greater rates of application and excellent results, but I go deeper and mix it with soil. 
Right. So, so you, what what you do is the, the the deeper you till, the more you dilute it, and the more you spread it out over time. So, depth of tillage will actually allow you to uh, add more. But you got to remember, as you add more, you're also adding uh, more food for those microorganisms, which are going to be more biologically active. So, we've also seen oxygen deprivation in not not so much in agronomic crops, but in certainly ornamental crops and potted plants where we've added way too much compost and the biologic activity has been so great that they've sucked the oxygen right away from the plant. Is botulism with bones an issue? Not if they've been composted. You know, we, there, there's really been no evidence of, of uh, botulism surviving uh, the composting process. So um, most of those so that's why we one of the reasons that we we favor composting is that we know that there are lots of different organisms that it will actually um, inactivate and um, and the product comes out pretty clean on the other end. So um, you know everything from avian influenza, we're exploring it with African swine fever now. So you know most most organisms are actually pathogenic organisms are taken care of during the composting process. Are you familiar with the use of biosolids from waste disposal processing for soil enhancement? I am. So biosolids is, a, is another organic material. There are um, different philosophies and concerns around biosolids, whether they've actually been composted or not composted, but uh, that's, a, that's a topic for another whole webinar if people want to get involved with it. And they're welcome to contact me uh, for more details about it. The biggest factor right now is, is uh, the PFAS issues around biosolids. When should you take a sample of the compost pile for analysis prior to anticipated use? For example, if the windrow had to remain undisturbed over a winter period. So I would I would take it, uh, you know, knowing how far you're, how long you're, it's going to take your lab to actually uh, process that sample, I would take it. Uh, as close to application time as possible. That way you're going to get the most accurate information. But, I, but at the same time, you know, I mentioned the Selvita test. The Selvita test uh, is a really good uh, field output, a field test that you can do, you know, the day before you're going to apply to see what the biological activity is. But if you're looking for NPK, the nutrient value, that the Selvita test does not give you that. Okay. Um, this is more of a statement on prior HPI outbreaks. Most producers were upset that the nitrogen levels were too low in compost and product. Unfortunately, I didn't have the soil amendment concept at that time. Yeah, and, um, that's, yeah, and that's, that's one of the things that's happened is, is most of our, in our large outbreaks, they've been in large agronomic communities where growers are very used to having, they want to apply things that are going to supply nitrogen. And that's the that's been the challenge for for people to kind of change the farmer's attitude towards this is not going to be a nitrogen source for you. It's going to be a soil amendment, and that's why I wanted to really emphasize that soil amendment part today. Okay, not sure if I understand the relationship between the C and ratio and the nitrogen tie up. Would you please explain one more time? Yeah, so C to N ratio is, is parts of carbon to parts of nitrogen. So as the parts of carbon actually become larger, so if it's above that 30 to 1, that means that there's not enough nitrogen to support the microbial population. So they're going to start robbing nitrogen from the soil or from what may be available to plants for their own use. So that's, that's the – when there's too much carbon – microbes are much more efficient at picking up soil nitrogen than the plant is, so it becomes unavailable to the plant. So as that c to n ratio drops and there's less carbon, more nitrogen is available to the plant, and eventually the, the nitrogen that was tied up in the microbes will actually become available to the plants as well. Okay. This is um, another statement. Um, but they think the answer to the question about chemical fertilizer and CEC is that the compost has a massive amount of CEC, 
whereas chemical fertilizer contributes nothing to CEC, not directly. That, that, that's absolutely true. Chemical fertilizers do not add any CEC at all. They are synthetic fertilizers for the most part. Uh, there, a lot of them are salt, so they are, um, so they don't contribute to the ability of that soil to hold nutrients. They're just a, they're just a plant nutrient, a soluble plant nutrient usually. Okay, can potash be tied up by microbial activity or would low potash levels be the result of high moisture content? I'm sorry, read, read the question again. And potash, potash? Pot, potash, up potash. Potash. Yeah. Or would so, low potash levels be the result of high moisture content? So potash is, uh, you know, is your potassium component of it. Uh, K2O is usually the, the, the normal form that we talk about in plant nutrients. It, it really is not affected by compost at all. It, there's a, usually a fair amount of uh, potassium in composting, so it should become readily available and it shouldn't be affected by, uh, by the microorganisms. And it actually, you should have more available potassium because it is a cation and is going to be uh, attached to those uh, negative particles and on the CEC it's going to it should improve the potassium availability over time. Okay here's another question if you only have a specific amount of land available to form windrows can you work backwards to determine how many AU you can accommodate for composting on the available land? Y yes so you would you would take the number of acres, you would multiply it by the uh, 10 yards or 15 yards, whatever the application rate's gonna be, and that's how many yards of compost you can have, and then you can work yourself backwards and uh, by um, using a little bit of algebra, the point six, six and the six yards, and then figure out how many animal units that would be. That, and it's just working those formulas backwards that I provided rather than forwards. Is there concern following the disease outbreak leading to mass mortality and composting? The crops grown using this compost will be contaminated. You know, but there, there, are, there are no animal diseases that I know of that um, are actually picked up by plants um, and into the tissue of plants. That said, that, that, that there could be, uh, but it's something that there's nothing that has been shown to be true or uh, has been a concern uh, by most people when we, when we deal with composting and cropping systems. It, it, there's just such a uh, diverse uh, population of, of organisms that it, they're, they're so separated. The biggest issue would come, uh, and we see this with like lead and with some other uh, minerals in soils, is that it can remain in the soil and then if you are exposed to dust or particles and you inhale the particles of the soil, then you can get lead, lead contamination over a long period of time. But, you know, that that is, uh, it, it's something that I've been asked a lot, but there is um, the risk of that is extremely, extremely low if there's any risk at all. Okay, we have a couple more questions. What is the best way to increase composting in a low moisture environment like we have in Arizona? So moisture, you know, that's getting into the, the composting process. So one of the things that I encourage people to do is when they – if they have large animal uh, outbreaks, is to, one of the things they have to do is they have to control the moisture of the, coming out of the animal. If they're grinding, that becomes a little bit easier. But because of those dry conditions, you can actually increase the amount of tissue per carbon so that the compost actually starts out wetter than what you may expect it to be in other regions and then as the Dry area in, in drier areas, it's going to evaporate fairly quickly, and but you'll still have enough moisture for that process to go. So I would increase the uh, 
the amount of animal tissue per carbon uh, to start those piles off a little bit on the wet side. You can also add moisture over time. It's really hard to add moisture uh, to a compost windrow. One of the ways that, that they do it in California is actually have a, almost like a, a plow that goes along the top of the, the windrow and makes a furrow, and then they have a tank truck with a hose or with an uh, extension on it that is actually dumping water into that, and then they reform those windrows. But it's a hard task to, to add water once the piles have started to dry out, they become hydrophobic. But starting with wet, wetter piles is, 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 will definitely help. And we have a couple more questions, and then we're going to have to wrap up. Are there any resources available, like a list or chart, that can be used as a resource for looking up neutralization times for different pathogens? Uh, you know, I'm sure that the epidemiologists and the uh, USDA staff have those. Uh, I don't have those at, the, at my disposal or no, but I'm sure that uh, I'm not sure if Rob's on, Mickness is on, or Lori Miller's on, but I'm sure that uh, one of those resources could probably help with that particular question. Okay. And an addendum to the contamination question, is there any monitoring that would need to be done to ensure contamination is not a concern? So when, when we're in a, involved in a disease outbreak, those piles um, go through a time and temperature regime that has been uh, approved by USDA as uh, sufficient to kill the pathogens within those piles. So there is no monitoring that takes place after those piles have been released from the USDA or from the state uh, for additional pathogens. Okay. Do you know about the amount of composting for managing dead animals in other U.S. areas beyond New England? Like what, what limits the use of composting by producers? How could uptake of composting be more strongly encouraged across the U.S.? Well, I think, I think, you know, we're seeing a, a, a strong um, interest in composting of animals throughout the U.S. And uh, part of the funding that was mentioned in my bio was with USDA, and we're actively doing educational programs. Uh, we had, uh, unfortunately, because of COVID, they were canceled, but they've been rescheduled for 2021. Uh, we'll have one in Iowa, we'll have one in Oklahoma, we'll have one in in California, and the, I know that North Carolina is going to have another one, and I know that Pennsylvania is going to have some training. So there's, and Missouri, I believe, got funded for some training. So there's a lot of different states throughout the U.S. that uh, are receiving funding and are are really interested in ramping up the composting for large animals and both for disease outbreaks and for catastrophic events and for normal mortalities. Uh, it's as, as we start to change our rendering industry and the renderers now won't take euthanized animals, particularly horses, uh, you know, there's got to be a, a, a sustainable disposal method for it. And uh, Dr. Koshona Martinson and I and a group are working on looking at uh, euthanasia drugs in Horses in uh, Minnesota and what happens to that drug in, in the composting process, which is great. Uh, so I think there's been a really interest in the last, you know, 10 years in this, and it's, it's just going to continue to increase. Okay. And the last question we're going to take is what about prions? Prions is, uh, is still a, a real question. I mean, uh, Dr. Tim Ruder in Alberta, Canada did some work on prions. Uh, the log reduction was significant, but not to the point where at least the Canadian government was satisfied with it. Uh, so it was, I believe it was around 270 to 280 days of composting. Uh, they had significant reduction in log reductions in the prions. But prions and, and hardened uh, organisms, anthrax is another one, uh, they're in case, uh, hardening case organisms that are still of concern for composting and, and 
we compost some of our deer with with uh, the prions, but uh, again, it's a it's a process that still needs some more work. Okay. So the one question, the other question I had was they wanted to know if we could send your PowerPoint out to the attendees. Uh, sure. I'd have to check and make sure that none of the pictures are. Uh, I'd, I'd like to uh, label some of the pictures for credit, and then, uh, then it can go out. Is that doable? Yeah. So what you, yeah. What you can do is just once you do that, send it to me. Once I get the once I get that, I get the attendee list. I'll go ahead and send it out to everyone. But I, it will be a PDF. I always yep. send them out as PDF. Okay. Yep, that, that, that works. Yeah. All right. Well, thank you, Mark, very much for that great presentation. We really appreciate um, your time today. Thank um, you. And I'd like to thank else who joined us. And just a heads up to watch your email for further NTEP upcoming webinars. And with that, I will say have a great afternoon. Okay. And this concludes our webinar.